Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Lore Week. I'm your host, Lore Runner. Actually, still kind of an outfit because of a video that should have gone live about five minutes ago. If you happen to be a uh, patron, then you should have gotten the video notification. And, well, then you can respond to it at your leisure. You got about three weeks, guys. Yes, that's right. The voting cycle for the floodgates has officially opened. So, that. You might wonder why we have this particular sound trick up. Uh, it's because for some reason none of my actual music programs are loading right now. So I have none of my local programs. This is actually on YouTube. <laughs> like Winamp and iTunes are still stalled loading. I'm not actually 100% sure why. And I didn't feel like dealing with it. So I just pulled up YouTube and pulled up the only YouTube soundtrack I know off the top of my head, which is Warcraft 1. Uh, you're welcome. Hello, everyone. Today we've got a couple of things to, to peruse topic-wise. The first thing I want to do... Oh, hey, hang on, hang on. Winamp just loaded. That's a good sign. Of course, I say that, then, and then, of course, everything loads. The moment I say that, of course, everything loads. Uh, hang on a second. Here we go. Perfect. All right. Uh, yes, voting is just for patrons. Patrons are the only people who matter. Everyone else is completely irrelevant. That's a slight exaggeration, obviously. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Now that that's done. One of the things I like to do every now and again, I have a Tumblr, for those of you not aware. Now, uh, some of you, of course, are like, you know, lore, Tumblr is horrible and awful, and it's got a terrible reputation. To which I say, yeah, I know, although I wasn't aware of that until well after I had a Tumblr. See, I use my Tumblr as a Q&A forum. People go to Tumblr and ask me questions, and then I respond to them. Now, I try to keep up to that on a regular basis, but sometimes people ask questions that I can't just respond to within a couple of minutes. I have to really sit and think about that. And, well, I usually like to take my time with those, which is some of the, one of the reasons why uh, I don't respond to questions sometimes for quite some time. As a thing I've started doing, I've started deciding to ask those questions here on stream so to give not only an audio answer myself, but to have you guys involved, see what you guys think about something as well. And that's what we're going to be starting with today. We're going to be starting with some Tumblr questions. And see what you guys think of those. So let's go ahead and jot a couple of down here. Because we actually have quite a few because I took that week off. So, first question here, for those of you who care to get involved in this. Uh, and I'll go ahead and jot this down really quick here. Blizzard comes to you to make the Naga starting zone, presuming Naga are actually allowed to be playable in World of Warcraft. The rules are they're like Pandarans, which means they can join either faction. They don't have to be Alliance or Horde. And they must keep the flippers as they are. <laughs> what would you do story and gameplay-wise, and how would their first interaction with both factions be? What do you guys think? Now, off the top of my head, I, have, I see no particular problem gameplay-wise with having them have no flippers. The only itch... Excuse me, the only issue at all will be mounts, and they've actually already solved the mount issue, as I've talked about many times before, so I don't really even feel the need to cover that. Uh, what I do think, however, is obviously we have to have some kind of racials, right? Now, I'm one of those weird people who thinks we should really just embrace racials and make them actually matter, or completely negate them and make them purely cosmetic. Take your pick. If, if we're negating them, I don't even need to answer that. If we're actually embracing uh, Naga racials, though, what we need to do is we need to make them actually really matter. So obviously underwater breathing, faster swim speed, this kind of stuff just kind of seems like a duh. You know, that, that's very obvious. I also like the idea of doing something like making it so that Naga can... <laughs> Hi, Balan. Uh, making it so that Naga can be... I'm trying to think of a way to basically make them good at functionally everything, if that makes any sense. So that probably means something like crit chance, or maybe haste, uh, possibly mastery. You know, basically giving them just a little bit of a boost, something that'll affect all the classes and make them just a little bit better than across the board. Now, all racials also have an activatable. Uh, they've got passive stuff, and then they've got something that they can actually activate, which allows them to do whatever. I admit I'm not sure what I would do with a Naga activatable. 
if I had to rein myself in. But if I didn't have to rein myself in, I'd make them have a summonable creature, like a murloc or whatever. And that murloc is basically functionally a guardian. Uh, for those of you not aware, a guardian is basically a step below a pet when it comes to uh, World of Warcraft creature nomenclature. And the guardian would just be able to help you fight for however many seconds is appropriate for balance. You know, 25 seconds, 30 seconds, 15 seconds, something like that. That's probably what I'd do. Just go, my minion! Story-wise, I know exactly what I would want to do. By the way, good morning everyone who's still s strolling in here. Hi, guys. Um, Berenian, haven't seen you in a while. Uh, so, one of the things I would want to do story-wise is I would try to make it so that the Naga become playable... I I've already given my theory on this. Make the Naga playable mid-expansion, right? Make that be a way to bring subs back into the expansion to prevent slump. I still think that's a good move, in my opinion, even creatively uh, and economically. But what I would do is I would make it so that the, the impetus, probably the 8.2 patch, if I were to guess, is we do something that breaks the mind control over the Naga, which means the Naga are now just kind of, huh? You know, for the first time in quite a while, this, the Naga suddenly have the ability to think for themselves. Um, the initial starting zone would be underwater, of course, um, and I would probably, I mentioned earlier Naga moving faster underwater. I'd probably make them at bare minimum the speed we have in Vashir, for those of you who know what I'm talking about, where you can zoom along even without a mount. Possibly make them actually get an underwater mount there too, which zooms along at the speed of the seahorse, which is basically epic flying speed underwater. Something like that. Anyways, so their underwater starting zone would have them just like, kind of similar in tone to the Cataclysm Forsaken Starter Zone, where we see all sorts of different undead who are all taking, hey, I'm undead now, in different ways. Some of them completely lose it. Some of them are are, are consigned to the thing. Some of them are just like, yeah, this is totally, this is just a Tuesday, what? You know, it show different people reacting different ways to suddenly having the fog lifted from them um, and have it be about trying to establish some kind of Naga society more or less on the fly. I, I would at least have one Naga villain who has nothing to do with, uh, what's her face, uh, Queen Ashara, but instead this Naga villain, male, female, doesn't actually matter. Uh, whoever it is is someone who wants to, well, obviously we're an autocratic society. We've always been that. I, I should be the one in charge. And they're not villainous because they're incredibly evil. They're villainous because... They want to usurp control and take over the Naga when the Naga have just started feeling freedom for the first time. Hence the idea that, you know, that's that's the main story arc of, this, of the Starter Zone, is trying to establish some kind of organization for these suddenly released Naga. Based on old concepts, like the old Night Elves, uh, what little memories they have of the last 10,000 years, thanks to the fog. You know, something like that. Yeah, exactly, Leander. I would have at least a few Naga being like, Oh, God! Oh, God! Like, completely insensate because they still think... That because their memories of the last 10,000 years are just nuked or so completely murked that they can't actually process that it's been that long that they are now this new creature. Stuff like that. I like that idea. Now, um... Someone earlier said something I wanted to address. Where was it? Uh... Well, Takoida was saying something about a grapple attack. You know, we could do that with the summon idea, too. So if we're really going nuts here, why not make it so you summon a guardian, and then what the guardian does depends on your spec, of your of what type of class you are, basically, because there's four. Uh, tank, tank, MDPS, RDPS, and healer. There's technically three, but there's really four. So, like, for example, if you are a tank, it does the grapple thing. In other words, that, that allows you to stun something, for example, or to root something. Actually, I, I would have, like, RDPS be the root. Healer, I don't know, I'd have to think about that. Something like that. I wouldn't do the snake coil thing. That would be... Eh, there's too many issues in the way of making that work. But I still think we could use something like that uh, with the minion thing. Anyways, that's probably what I'd do with that. I hope that answers that question. Next question. <laughs> now, this one I, w I definitely want you guys to get involved in here. Because this is about Kingdom Hearts. Uh, so let's get a timestamp here. Hang on just a second. Uh, 
And I quote, Now I know from your stream conversation with Rax that Marvel and Star Wars will have no presence in Kingdom Hearts 3, but let's say for fun, they had two secret hidden optional bosses of Thanos and Vader. Separate, of course. And if we were put in charge of their design and mechanics, how would we do it, basically? You know, uh, what kind of abilities would they have, speed, power, time limit, etc. How would we design the fights, basically? Uh, is, is that patch ever coming out, Valerian? I keep hearing about it. <laughs> I still haven't played Stellaris in like the last three patches at this point. Yeah, do not give Thanos a power stone. <laughs> I mean, honestly, funnily enough, I was thinking about the Thanos thing. As much as it would be neat from a gameplay perspective to have him have the power stones and have like a move or a move set based on which stone he has active, that would be cool, but also a little bit ridiculous if you think about it. But if we get rid of the stone, if we get rid of the gauntlet, then that just makes Thanos the Hulk except with a brain. Now that could work. But that would basically make Thanos into something like the Goro fight back in Mortal Kombat 1. In other words, he hits extremely hard, he's very fast, and he's very hard to dodge. Just a, just make it a berserker bum rush kind of a fight, where you have to constantly try and stay ahead of him and get away from him and pluck him down. while And he could just destroy you in like three hits, something like that. That's just what I was thinking about Thanos. Because, I mean, Thanos doesn't really have a lot of a shtick, and since this is specifically going to be based on the MCU Thanos, because it would be stupid not to at this point. Right? I mean... <laughs> Funk! Because the only other way I could think of it is to, is to do the Power Stone thing, like I said. <sighs> that's true. Also, if he gets a hold of you. Like, if he actually grabs you, just... Funk! And that's the end. Like, if he tries to grapple you, that's that's basically the end of that. Um, like Goro, like you said. For those of you who haven't played Mortal Kombat 1, Goro was actually a pretty badly designed boss fight. It was basically as unfair as humanly possible. Um, he hit like a truck, and if he grabbed you, you died. <laughs> and of course, this is Mortal Kombat, so I mean that fairly literally. Um, yeah, exactly. Thanos just went one-on-one -on -one with the Hulk without having to resort to the stones. Yeah. So, but but yeah, that's, that's kind of what I was thinking for Thanos. Just make him the, the doomed wrecking ball. Bam! Bam! Stop! You know, just, just give him those kind of attacks. I would probably not give him a lot of health, to be honest with you. I don't think a berserker doom boss needs to also be an endurance fight. That's just my opinion. So I'd probably make it so that you could take Thanos down within like a minute or two, especially if you're good. But he, you know, he will destroy you in a second if you slip up. Uh, now, Vader! That's a lot more interesting. Oh, I like that idea, Leander. Hang on, Leander just said something. Show Thanos juggling the Olympus Titans with no effort. I like that idea. Um, yeah, kind of like Akuma, it's a good way to put that. Because I like the idea that the intro is... Sora's, like, like you, you enter this thing and, like, there's, like, this digital... No, not a lot of health next time. You're wrong. You're incredibly wrong. Um, there's this digital thing. And, um... And then, like, Sora looks around strangely. And then he looks up and he sees, like, the Earth Titan just get smashed into the ground. Like, the Earth Titan gets flung. And you just see it smashed in the ground. He's like, huh? And he looks up and there's, the, there's like, the head of the Ice Titan. Which lands right next to him, and then over the like the the the, the mountain, just Thanos kind of comes up like, and does that pose he's so that he always does in the MCU stuff. Just well, that's why we're designing this max time, not them. So how would you design it? And then so Thanos is there, and he just does the pose, and Sora's like, and again we're trying to make this not canon, so no dialogue, no story. So Sora's just like. Okay, <laughs> you know, just get this kind of, all right, I think I can handle this kind of a fight. And then, like, it, just to keep going with this, have, like, the Fire and Wind Titans both just attack Thanos at once. And then cut to Sora, who's just going... As, as you can hear the battle in the distance. And then it cuts back to them, and they're just crushed. Both of them are just crushed. And Thanos just, just cracks his fingers, pops his neck. 
And then you fight him. And he, he just... And his very first move, like, I, I love this idea because I've always liked this boss idea. Basically, no, I have no plans of watching Venom. Uh, basically, if, if you don't dodge the first second combats available, he just kills you. Like, he, he winds back and then he does one of those lunging punch things. <gasps> Your dedication will be rewarded. And then a donation comes in. That's that's just the most terrifying thing I can think of. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Jimmy Bailey, as ever. Much appreciated. Let me jot that down. I already got it up this time. For once, I'm actually ready for you. I've been keeping up. I've been keeping up. Website is up to date. Yeah, like Kingdom Hearts 2 Sephiroth. All right, the fight's begun. Dodge! Okay, you're okay. Thank you again very, very much, Jimmy Bailey. Now, um... <laughs> See, I'm really hesitant to add the stones to it. I really am. I, if I'm being honest, I wouldn't. Me, personally, I wouldn't. Several of you guys are saying add a stone. So how would you do it? Like, what would you do gameplay-wise to make the stones work? Without being stupidly over... Like, we can't give him a reality stone. Just straight up. The reality stone is just too much. <laughs> Unless you want to have a scene where Sora turns into a slinky, you know? That's too much. Actually, now that I think about it, Julius is kind of similar to what I'm picturing. I didn't even realize that. Because Julius is kind of the same sort of thing. Very fast and hits very hard. I like how Max Time and Rax are both thinking the teleport thing. That's kind of neat. Now, Takoida has not a bad idea. It could make it so that, that we can literally add a timer to the fight. Now, I don't personally think that's necessary, but, uh, you know, we could have it so, like, after 50 seconds, he gains the first stone, probably power, or whatever allows him to teleport. You know, the weakest stone. After, you know, uh, another 50 seconds passes or 45 seconds passes or whatever, then he gets a second stone, and then that adds to his move set. And by this point, he would be so insanely difficult that only the best players, theoretically, would be able to keep up. In other words, make it a soft enrage, not a hard enrage. So each he just gets stone after stone after stone, unless he gets all five stones. That would be the hard enrage. If, he managed, if you somehow inhumanly manage to keep up to the five stones, he just... Oh, hang on. And then the fight's over. That's not a bad idea. I kind of like that. So you have the soft enrage of him just getting worse and worse the longer you take. We could also make it so that rather than each stone coming in at a time, each stone comes in at a health percent. I kind of like the time idea better, personally, because the time idea is rewarding you, the player, for doing better in the fight, whereas the health idea means you're guaranteed to fight him with four stones, which I don't care for. I know Kingdom Hearts likes to do health-based phases, but... Yeah, I, I prefer the, the time thing. I think that works better. What I would also probably do, I would probably make it so... Now that I'm thinking about it, he would get the first stone probably after like 60 seconds. Second stone after about 45. Third stone after 30. Basically, it speeds up a little bit. Like, if you haven't beat him by the time he gets the second stone, it just starts to get mean. Hey, we're discussing game design, Kid Viper. <laughs> and yeah, we have to tone this down to the MCU. Because we have to. Uh, where would the background be? Honestly, the only thing I could think of is uh, uh, Hercules' place. Uh, Olympus Coliseum. It doesn't necessarily have to be. But what I do know is that I'm filled with fear. Or today, Phobos. Um, so what the hell, Valerian? I know you just got a pay raise and everything. <laughs> Oop, through Mount Olympus. I like that max time. Although, somewhat early, uh, Pelayan mentioned the idea of setting it on Titan. I actually kind of like that idea, too. It'd make, it, they'd have to do new background design. But I do like the idea of setting it on Titan. What the hell? Is wrong with you, Valerian? Why are you giving me this much money? Stop it. Stop. <sighs> 
thank you. Thank you very, very much, Emperor Valerian. Uh, as ever, I much appreciate your support and your continued patronage, and you're awesome, and I don't know what to say. Thank you. Um, I will put that towards both equally, if that's okay with you. Thank you. Um. Um, yeah, so, uh. <laughs> hang on. <laughs> Trying to catch my thoughts back up. Um. So, Max Time said he would set it in Mount Olympus, which I like the idea of. Let's assume for a moment that time and budget aren't an issue. Where would you want the fight set? For Thanos. I admit I love the idea of it on Olympus, but if I'm being honest, I know what I would do if time and budget weren't an issue. And I'll go ahead and give you my idea. I would have it so that you go, like, you go and there's the... The Titan Cup... Omega or something like that, right? On on the Olympus world. And it's an optional thing. And you're like, okay. And like I said earlier, Sora and Goofy and Donald walking out. And then it glitches out. But rather than him beating the Titans like I was talking about earlier, just nicks all of that. Nicks all of that. Instead, the glitch still happens. And he's like, huh? And Sora just looks around and everything just kind of glitches. And the background just kind of slowly glitches away into Titan. To the point where we are now seeing the back, the, basically the same visual of when they were fighting uh, on Titan in uh, in Infinity War, and then you're just like, now this would be a completely different take on it because earlier we were going to show Thanos just wiping the floor with the Titans in order, to, not only for the uh, visual pun but also to demonstrate his power. But here, what we could do is something more serious because what we could do was you were just looking around like. You know, and then the camera pans around, and we see a nice shot of, you know, it was beautiful. And then the then Sora's like, no, 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 Goofy. Goofy goes, and just points. No dialogue, remember. And Sora looks up at what he's pointing, kind of squints. And then the camera is zoomed in to the point, like, where it's taking up all of the space. And there's this big golden gauntlet right here. Which is basically covering most of the camera. And then you see a purple hand kind of reach down, pick it up. <laughs> Uh, excuse me, it's left hand, left hand. Shunk. And then the camera again is focused on the gauntlet and as it kind of pulls away, then you see his face and he just looks up and he looks straight at the camera and gets this little bit of a grin on his face. Not a not a cocky grin. More of a grim grin. Like, you know, I'm ready, I'm ready for this. And that would be when he does the lunge punch right at you. Just foom! I think that's how I do that. If we're, sh if we're shifting that. Oh, that's true. We can also do the same thing on the Keyblade Graveyard rather than on uh, on uh, uh, Olympus. Anyways, um, so the uh, oh, hang on, Hazardous has an idea. Let's see. Thanos naturally uses all the stones in the fight with the Titans. So now we can't use them right away. Fight starts at the time. Okay, that's not a terrible idea. That's not a terrible idea. It's the worst idea in the known history of the universe, but it's a good idea. <laughs> no, I was I was actually thinking of the same thing with Jaluda. We've actually established in lore, this is more in the comics, uh, that the Infinity Stones don't work in other settings, in other universes. So, so yeah, Vader. Darth Vader. Now, the problem is, unlike Thanos, who I think we really have a fairly solid baseline that we can't stray too much from, Vader, there's so much you can do with Darth Vader. Many games over the years have done a lot to make Darth Vader an interesting fight or a boss fight or whatever. And it's it's almost an option, a situation of too many things you can do with him. Um, I'm actually really torn myself. But I have a couple ideas. But I, I, want, I want to let you guys talk a little bit about what you do with Vader before I start yammering on. Ugh, dehydrated this morning. I don't know why. Multi-phase, multi-location. I was thinking the same thing. Hi, Dream Whisperer. How are things? The Force Unleashed. That was a good one. I agree. Oh, Jesus, Max Time. Yeah, Big Hero 6 is like, we got this, guys. With teamwork, we can take... <laughs> Here's the 
Hero? Hero? Can you just picture it? Um, that's actually a good idea, Max. Time I like that. <laughs> Don't choke on your aspirations. Um, so here's what. No, I would make. I know this is going to sound really fanboy y, but I would probably make Vader the harder fight of the two. Um, not because I think Vader's stronger than Thanos, but because I think there's more that we could do as designers with Vader than we could with Thanos. And because I think that, they, to be completely blunt, Vader is more of a culturally iconic fight guy, and therefore should be treated as more than simply, you know, a guy with a lightsaber. My opinion. Plus, Vader is also someone who more easily slides into the idea of the combat system of Kingdom Hearts. Whereas Thanos kind of does, but he Thanos feels more like a boss. Whereas Vader feels more like, you know, fighting Xemnas, for example. So first you find the high ground. No, 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 Kid Viper. <laughs> you, if you get the high ground, and there, there'd be like a reaction command. And if you hit the reaction command, you do like the exact same... He jumps up, and you start to do the exact same maneuver as Obi-Wan, and then he chops your arms off, and then you die. No, I'm kidding. No jokes. No jokes. We have to make this too super serious. Super serial, guys. That's why, how I would do it, anyways. I would have it start in a corridor. Here's what I would have happen. Um, picture Sora enters into an area, and he's like, oh, what's going on? He opens the door, and it's like almost pitch black. Not completely pitch black, but very close to it. And you look around kind of like, huh? Door shuts behind you, and Goofy's like, oh, no. And then you look, and you just sort of hear a, and then you look forward, and there's Vader just standing at the other side of the corridor. So the first phase of the fight would start in the corridor. At a certain point in the fight, he would basically smash you through the wall or the door or whatever. And then you would basically fight in some place that, if not literally, figuratively looks like the duel with Luke in Empire Strikes Back over the pit. Right? So, we've, so basically, the idea is to start the fight in Rogue One segue into phase two in Empire Strikes Back. And then I would get a little bit weird, because the third thing I would do is I would have the third fight be in mid-air as you're falling through that pit. Try something new here. Then after that, I would probably go... I, I, I would be torn on whether to have Mustafar, Death Star, or Death Star, Mustafar. Because I like the idea that it ends where Vader's own life ends, but I also like the idea that it ends where Anakin's life ends. I'm not sure. What do you guys think? But either way, I would do Rogue, Empire, Plummet, and then one of the other two, a five-phase fight. Which, in my opinion, is a good number for phases for a uh, uh, super optional. See, Kael'thas in BC for a good example of a five-phase fight. Yeah, see, you can see why I'm torn, Huthor. Because both of them have some things. I kind of like the idea of Mustafar to Death Star. Like, again, it doesn't literally have to be. In fact, I don't even want it to literally be that. I just want it to be a place that looks like it, or a place that feels like it. You know, I turn to my graphics designers and engineers and artists and say, okay, what I want is something that evokes the feeling and artistic style of Mustafar, of the Death Star, of Cloud City, right? But it was a good fight, Uthor. It's one of the best fights in BC. <laughs> now, Leander gives an idea which is less literal than what I was thinking. So you could have it be more metaphysical. Rax also gives the same idea here. <laughs> Make it someplace where it's like... And then you shift to the next area. I'm not sure I like that idea. I'd have to think about that. I'd have to really think about that. Because I have to admit, it really appeals to me the idea that basically, from a technical perspective, the arena is basically one large area. It's just you are only in one section of it at a time. Like, I can actually picture how I would map it out. But if we wanted to go completely insane, hear me out. Hang on, hang on. I, I need a different song for this. 
I need like a Doom song for this. Give me just a moment. I know exactly the song I want. Give me just a sec. So if we wanted to go completely insane, have Darth Vader be in the realm of darkness, okay? And you're going through the realm of darkness, and there's all you know. It's it's the same general visual aesthetic of what was going on with uh, Aqua's area, if you remember. You know, an area that's kind of dissect, di slowly falling apart into crystals. And just picture Sora and Donald and Goofy, and you're going through, and it's like, huh? It's like shrinking and shrinking and shrinking until you're basically in the corridor, except the corridor is all crystalline. And as you f move further along, it starts to solidify into an actual corridor. Do some behind the scenes loading stuff so that the crystal stuff goes away, and then you're just in the corridor. Then you hear the breathing. <sighs> lightsaber fight, you know, lightsaber ignites, then you have the corridor fight. At a certain point in the fight, he literally shatters the corridor. It it shatters into the the dark crystals which fly everywhere. And then we have the the fight basically kind of the way I'm picturing it is effectively you're you're on like a mechanical device which is partially falling apart in the middle here. And you can see bits and pieces of what could be interpreted to be Cloud City in the distance, but all of it's still sharded, right? It's still affected by the, the darkness crystals of the World of Darkness. And then as you defeat that fight, what I would do is I would, again, getting into completely insane territory, let's skip the falling fight. Let's just cut straight to Mustafar. Make it so that the crystals start to glow red more and more through, as you're pushing through phase two. And by the time you get to the point where you are effectively at the end of phase two, they are melting into magma. And then the whole area just kind of melts and morphs into this dripping magma area. And you and just this lava fall smashes through in the background and starts, uh, starts basically a river of lava going under what's left of the arena because some of the outer pieces have now since fallen away and melted away, shrinking your available area, right? So it would affect your gameplay area in addition to being visual. Then you're fighting basically on this hovering chunk of what used to be Cloud City, which is partially dripping and melting away into this uh, river of lava that you're hovering over, okay? Now, the, the final transition would be difficult, but the way I would want to do it is as you're beating him down... First of all, I would love it if his armor also showed some damage, kind of like they did in Rebels, for example. Um, but as you're fighting him down, at certain... Uh, let's call them key points in his health, or whatever it is we use to determine these phase changes. Probably health. Um, you see, like, the whole screen just shudders for a second. And a chunk of it solidifies. It goes from this weirdly morphic you know, horrible, kind of not-quite-pseudo-delusional look that we've had going the entire time into something far more concrete. And then as as you continue pushing through Phase 3, more and more of the, the background starts to concrete into this with these, with these sharp judders until it, you can actually see... until the lava has effectively receded down below. It's still there. There's still the lava down below. But you're up here now. And you start to see, like, bits of terrain which look a lot more like the Death Star, the inside of the second Death Star. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Uh, and then, uh, then that would be the transition I would use into the final Death Star fight. Something like that. Uh, anyways, that's kind of how I would do the visuals of the fight. So, actual combat! I haven't even talked about that yet. Uh, I should answer Tazara's question uh, really quick. The blue stuff is the stuff that's in Tazara. That's the stuff that's in. So the blue stuff is the stuff that's going to be the final locked-in stuff. That's all. Um, yeah, I was thinking that too, Dakota. In fact, that exact same uh, mentality. So, fighting style. One of the things I like the idea of is that each of these phases has a completely different fight style. So, for phase one, the corridor, okay? I would have Vader moving very slowly. The Juggernaut, the, the, the unstoppable object. But in the very sort of slow... 
Every step is very smooth and very heavy. You know, you can almost feel each footstep. And he's very hard to hit because he parries the hell out of everything. And if you get near him, he just... <laughs> right? Thus making the entire first phase basically about just trying to hit him at all. Trying to break through his defenses. Second phase, when we're hovering over Mustafar, I would make this more of the magey kind of a fight. Kind of like what he did in Empire, if you're remembering. The idea of... Or except, I'm actually saying... I'm sorry, the third phase is Mustafar. The second phase is the uh, uh, Cloud City, but I'm actually still right. I would still make it more magey. The idea that he would actually start, you know, <laughs> literally flinging terrain objects at you. Um, I, I love the idea of him... I, basically, yeah, focusing on the Force rather than his saber. I would basically have him turn... I, I would almost th think about him turning off his saber completely and just standing over here. I will be picking of the ones that are not in. Uh, that are not voted, if and but. I have not picked yet, no. Otherwise, they'd be in the blue stuff. Whoops, excuse me. So, and I would just have him stand there, almost stock still. You know, trying to, to convince the player to just, come on. And the close, I would have the types of attacks he use vary based on his range to you. The closer you are to him, the more he just absolutely th flings tons of terrain and tons of magma and tons of stuff, just absolutely destroying it. He doesn't have to turn off his sword. He could have his sword right down the middle like this, like, you know, with, with the ad, uh, on guard thing. But either way, he's just standing there, completely still, while the, the arena is attacking you. Um, and the closer you get, the harder it is. Phase three would be the freight train, like Kord said. <laughs> Phase three would be the the, the phase where he would basically turn into Zemnas. I don't know, have a better way to explain that. It would, uh... That's not a bad idea, Dakota. That's not a bad idea. I'd have to think about that. Ooh, no, I've got an idea for that. Hang on, hold on to that one thought. So phase three would be him basically emulating Anakin's fight, fighting style from Revenge of the Sith. Uh, the one where he is very mobile, very, very fast. And, you know, hitting a very large swath of area at once. But I wouldn't have the mage stuff. I would be almost entirely with the lightsaber for Phase 3. Because I would want to save the mage stuff for Phase 4 on the Death Star. My idea is that Phase 4 would be basically everything. He has, he would have his defenses up. He would be moving very fast, hitting very fast, and in a wide area. And stuff would be being flung at you based on relative how f close you are to him. Probably in this case, closer is worse, because he's actually trying to get to you. Something along those lines. Just just make it as absolutely insane as possible. Uh, and I think that's what I would do with that. <laughs> ah, excuse me. I like the idea of being able to break his defenses with uh, multiple spells. Like, think about this, for example. Let's say you cast Thundaja on him. Well, he just catches it on his lightsaber. But then you have to immediately follow it with something else in order to actually get through to him because he's currently blocking the Thundaja, you know, something like that. I don't know. Hey, LM. Or... Uh, grunge. What's up, dude? I also kind of like the idea of at least one of the phases being a survival fight. We did shrink it down to four phases from five. Maybe we could squeeze in a survival fight in there. I don't know. He would definitely have the occasional force choke. And if I'm being completely honest, I'd probably have there be nothing you can do about the force choke. But if we're going to do a thing where you can't resist the force choke, like if, there's, if it's out of the player's control to resist this, I probably wouldn't have the force choke do damage. Rather, I would have the force choke obviously stun you, but then also reposition you against your will, if that makes any sense. In other words, he he doesn't just choke you, he chokes and throws you. And then now you're over there, and he would always throw you into a position that would be more beneficial to him based on which phase he's in, if that makes any sense. And then, you know, your goal would be <laughs> reposition as quickly as you can. Something like that. Because I really don't like the idea of because the only other uh, option... Oh, that's actually not a bad idea, Dakota. Have it so that, that we could squeeze in our, our, our other phase by not actually having another phase there. By having it so he can fling you over the edge and you have to do 
something in order to get back up. I don't want to just resort to reaction commands, but I mean, I do admit, since this is Kingdom Hearts 3 we're talking about, I kind of like the idea about running up a falling cascade of molten crystals shaped like Bespin as you're trying to not fall into the lava. Something like that. I don't know. I'd have to think about that. Yeah, I'm already getting several voots. I'll be checking these later. I'm not going to check them while I'm streaming, obviously. But I'm getting notifications about those voots. So I'll be updating that tonight when I'm done streaming. <sighs> ah. One more thing. If I'm being 100% honest, I would not have you fight Vader with Sora, Donald, and Goofy. I'd have you fight Vader with Sora and Riku. Assuming that's a thing in Kingdom Hearts 3, which obviously we don't know. But I like the idea of the light and the dark fighting Darth Vader that just appeals to me. And that's the only reason i do that. The alternative, of course, is to have it just be you by yourself. Yeah, I thought about that hazardous, but honestly, no. I don't think I'd do that. I think Anakin needs to be out of this. This is an optional non-story fight. We're fighting Darth Vader. The only way I would bring Anakin Skywalker into an optional non-story fight about Darth Vader is if you're fighting both of them. The, you know, the, the fast, rapid ju you know, juggernaut versus the slowly moving, unstoppable object. And you gotta deal with both of them. Which would suck. Sorry, I'm, I'm having trouble breathing because I'm, I've got blood clotting. So please forgive me if I'm louder than usual with breathing. Mm. I was actually thinking about the Thanos fight. I'm, I think I kind of would probably have that alone, too. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about that. Hang on, guys. Hear me out. Leander just gave me an idea. I'm going to steal your idea completely, Leander, without giving you any credit at all. Credit to Leander. Hear me out. Let's add a fifth phase to this. So first phase, corridor, very hard to hit. Second phase, the the the, the dying area of, of the open range and the mage type. Third phase, the molten magma, the, the terrain has, has, has gotten extremely unstable, and he's just ricocheting around like crazy. Fourth phase, Death Star 2, you know, Emperor's Throne Room. Basically everything previously combined. Just a huge frenetic phase. I would also probably make phase four a little bit shorter, either in terms of how much health is required to push through it or in terms of time. I still think health would work in this case for this type of style. Add a fifth phase at the end. Everything goes... Oh, welcome. Pay close attention. Hopefully you'll learn something. This is the fifth phase right here. That's the fifth phase. It's from Stands a Lot for $11.53. But he doesn't say anything other than fear. Thank you very, very much, Stands a Lot. Has ever much appreciated. What would you like to put that towards? Um, this is pure hypothetical, boss baby. So, in the fifth phase, everything is jet black. Kind of like, if you remember in Kingdom Hearts 1. God damn it. I keep talking too long. There. If you remember in Kingdom Hearts 1, there's a section basically during the final fight where everything is basically pitch black and all you can see is there's an emblem on the ground and there, you can see the Heartless by their eyes. Like that kind of black, right? You can basically not see anything. You with me? Uh, hang on a second. Where's my stream? But there it is. Stands a lot. Ender all. You got it. Thank you very, very much again. So imagine that, except there's no emblem this time. It's just black. All you are is in a black void. You can hear his breathing, but there's no indicator of when he's going to hit you other than when he's basically less than a second away from hitting you, and then he hits you with his lightsaber. Basically, imagine him igniting it in mid-swing and then slicing it into you and then de-igniting it again. But I would add an audio cue, possibly two audio cues. First, I would have the audio cue of his breathing. If you remember from the original trilogy, he, he's, uh, his deep breathing thing gets more high-paced when he's in the middle of combat. 
So you're going through this black void, and you can't see anything. No visual indicators whatsoever. I might even literally not have him rendered, just to do ensure this. You just hear... And then it speeds up a second or two before... And then he's gone again. But if you manage to dodge or block or parry that particular... Actually, probably parry, I think, is the best idea. That's That swing, then you get a hit on him. And again, I wouldn't make this a long phase. But I would make that the final phase. It's just, you know, literally in the darkness, and all you can see is his freaking lightsaber. Something like that. And the glow from his lightsaber. Anyways, that's that's how I do the phase five. There we go. We're back up to five phases. We made it happen. <laughs> and then you, you get the high ground, and it's over for some reason. I mean, it worked so well for Maul, right? Reward for beating him. You beat Darth Vader, dude. No, let's be honest. We all know exactly what the reward would be for beating Darth Vader. A lightsaber keyblade. That's just so obvious. I don't even... <laughs> it doesn't even matter if it's good. It's, it's a lightsaber keyblade. <laughs> That's all you need from that. I would say yes, Adam, but not in the final phase. Not in phase five. Only in phase four. Speaking of which, the Tha what would we get from Thanos? I mean, I could I could mentally picture a a keyblade that's basically stylized like the gauntlet. I could picture that, you know, the kind of same gold, kind of large, bronzish looking curves to it. And maybe like you know, one of each of the colors going around. That'd be pretty easy. But I have to admit. I also like the idea more, rather than a key, uh, an Infinity Gauntlet Keyblade, I like the idea that you just have the Infinity Gauntlet. It doesn't do anything, it's cosmetic, it's like the crowns in the final mixes, but you just walk around and Sora just has the Infinity Gauntlet on. Oh, and I would have both the lightsaber uh, Keyblade and the Infinity Gauntlet be the kind of thing that you could take over into New Game Plus. And just, so, and it would be in cutscenes, so you're like, hey Jack! You know, hey, hey, Captain Sparrow, and he's just he's just got the Infinity Gauntlet on him. Something like that. Reward the player. Make it, make it so they can keep it on. That's what I do. <laughs> he, gets, he gets the fake. <laughs> Damn it. And yes, of course, New Game Plus has to be in Kingdom Hearts 3. That's just such a duh! To, which is funny, because I think, like, Recoded, I think, is the only Kingdom Hearts we've had that's had a New Game Plus to date. I'm not sure about that. Anyways, so that's that question. Um, <laughs> uh, I got one final question for you, not related to Kingdom Hearts, and then we'll move on to actual news. Uh, whoops, I got the wrong thing up here. Oh, where's the thing? Where's the thing? No. This one. There we go. So one more th Tumblr question before we move on. Oh, where's my timestamp? Maybe I'm a monster, guys. Oh, that's true. Point two at New Game Plus 2. Uh, so the question here... This is actually an interesting one to me, because the question boiled down to its basic components is, here's a very typical thing. What's your spin on it? So here's the question. What ideas would you implement to portray playing a vampire lord in terms of both personal and political power? What would the story be about in that game, and how would you market that game? Uh, no, Tigzar. This is, this is the answer Tumblr section. God, we talked about the Kingdom Hearts thing for 30 minutes. Um, uh, I would say possibly Cord if Thanos did not have the gauntlet. But even then, that's only a possibly. Because a lightsaber is still a lightsaber whichever setting you're in. Bzz. Anywho. Um, so I have to admit, I'm one of those people who really likes the idea of... Uh, of vampires. I do think it's been a little overdone, just like zombies, and I do also think it's been done very poorly. <laughs> My light, excuse me. But, um, I do very, very much like the idea of playing a game as a vampire lord, like you just start off as a vampire lord. God, I guess, <laughs> um, I have to admit, my first knee jerk reaction is basically something kind of like Crusader Kings 2 except with a little bit more gameplay on the side. So let me explain what I'm talking about a little bit. 
I would make a game that functionally has two aspects of gameplay. One is the political, and one is the, for lack of a better term, combat. Um, but it would be, the, the majority of the gameplay would be about managing the political side of things. That would be the bulk of it. As Takoyo was saying, minions, territory, economics, deals and ar arrangements with the other vampires, either vampires beneath you, your own vassals, for example, or other vampire lords who are threats to you, that kind of a thing. Um, now, funnily enough, everyone's talking about Vampire the Masquerade. This kind of thing would sleet, slot neatly into Vampire the Masquerade, at least before the apocalypse happened. So... <laughs> <laughs> But I do like the idea of there being some form of actual combat or actual gameplay outside of the political realm. Just personally. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about that in a second. Uh, would what, Tigzar? I'm sorry. Oh, you're talking about... Right, right, I know what you're talking about. I probably would not actually set it in Vampire the Masquerade, but only because licensing is evil. <laughs> like, if I could just take over the world, licensing wouldn't be a problem. I still haven't played Vampire, so I can't speak to that. That would be kind of nice, Leander. I like that idea. Um, I like the idea of doing sci-fi as well, because I've always liked the idea of undead in sci-fi, which is something that is almost never done, at least not properly. The more I'm thinking about it, the more I'm thinking that, I know this is all going to sound really stupid, but I think what I would want to do with the combat side of the gameplay is basically XCOM. Turn-based, grid, tactical. Uh, it That kind of gameplay naturally slides into the sort of RPG-ish kind of a thing, uh, customization of specific units and your own abilities that you can do. And I like that type of gameplay in general. Like, there's a lot of stuff we could do more real-time with that, but I just think that would be a nice little niche, especially since, to my knowledge, we've basically never had that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Have the main character basically be a boss tier. In fact, one of the things I would like is the idea that, let's say you have... This is a made-up term, of course. But let's say you have something like a blood limit. You can spend your blood limit. It's basically a capacity. It's not a real currency, so it's a capacity. And you can spend this capacity on minions or yourself. And that that's the kind of thing you can use in order to buff yourself and make yourself... Uh, it basically, customize your unit for these actual XCOM sections. Or, you know, have a support guy and have a melee guy or have a shooter guy and blah, 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 blah. You say that like that's a bad thing, Grunge. <laughs> but you know, that kind of an idea. Uh, now, that would take some very careful uh, crafting in order to make sure it's balanced. Because the idea would be that neither minions nor personal is better. Obviously, there's always going to be a best spec. But the idea is to make them both relatively equal to make it so that the player has the choice. You could also probably go partial into one and partial into the other. I have one minion and I'm mostly empowered or have... I'm sorry, LM the Great. Aren't you grunge? I could be wrong. Wouldn't be the first time I've forgotten someone's nickname. Yeah, I, I actually was kind of wanting this with Overlord as well. I have to admit, the more I'm thinking about this, the more I'm just kind of thinking of Overlord. Um, excuse me. But yeah, I, I like that idea. I like that idea of... Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I'll just call you LM. <laughs> if that's okay. Uh... Grunge was a one of my viewers who changed his name to something, which I thought he changed it to that. LH, that's right, it's LH, not LM. That's what it was, that's what it was. Um, sorry. <laughs> he is also someone who hasn't been on my stream in a long time. <laughs> and, yeah, anyways, I'm an idiot. Uh, I apologize. So, you know, th that's the XCOM side of things. Uh, the political side of things almost writes itself. I, there's just too much to do with that. The only question for me is setting. Now, if I was to be completely insane, I would say make it so that there's multiple campaign options. In other words, have one set in the 1400s. Have one set in the 1990s or 2000s. Have one set in 2400. You know, probably those three general uh, categories. 
I do like that idea. But that might be getting a little bit too insane with regards to time and budget. Hey, Javin. Yeah, exactly, boss baby. And the, 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 the other benefit of having a campaign set per era, A, as pointed out, you could just play the same character. B, you can you can basically it would it would, it would be custom made for expansions or for DLCs, right? Here's the steampunk expansion where we add all sorts of new steampunk units and steampunk stuff you can do, you know, graft steam powered gatling guns onto your minions, you know, that kind of a thing, right? And of course, yeah, the idea would be eventually you do a grand campaign going through the whole gamut. Uh, kind of like people do CK2 and EU4, you know, that kind of a thing, except um, Brazil is voting? Oh, right, I guess we're approaching voting season, aren't we? I only know that because I keep getting ads about it. <laughs> I also really like the idea of adding some kind of generational mechanic. Okay, I, I guess that means something different when it comes to vampires, but uh, let me explain myself a little bit better here. I suppose grand strategy would be the, the genre, Adam. Make it so that... You start off as Bob, right? And Bob is like, hi, I am Bob. I am the great vampire lord Bob. Now, one of the things that you would have, you could do as an option is to sire a, I forget the term, you know, a child, basically. Hey, you are my next generation down. And that person is the next generation down. If anything happens to you, if you actually die in combat, it's not the end of the campaign. You shift down to playing as Bobette, you know, your, your next generation down. Play as your ancestor, kind of a thing. Progeny, whatever, I don't know. I, I can't remember my terminology, I'm sorry. Now, this is another reason I would like this to not be based on uh, Vampire of the Masquerade, because Vampire of the Masquerade's rules for generations and the power levels of each are actually pretty strict. They're not super strict, but they're pretty strict, and I'd rather just toss that all the window, toss out of the window. Uh, I would rather have some other mechanic, probably politically oriented, which is what enables your blood currency, your, your blood meter, right? So in other words, obviously you want to have control and manipulation over people and merchandise and, and industry and territories, but there would also be another thing that you could get a hold of, and the more of that thing you have, the more personal power that you have access to. So in other words... Um, Excuse me, you know, Bob would literally be capable of being made stronger in the XCOM segments based on how you deal with the political segments, because he would have more of that blood meter, if I'm making any kind of sense here. I like Takoya's idea, I wanted to discuss that next. Yeah, I don't I don't like that, Shaluda. I've never liked that idea. <laughs> Good morning, Venters. Castlevania might work. I, I just said it in my own setting, if I'm being honest, but, you know, we could set it in several other things. Um... But then the idea, like, so let's say that, for example, this is just completely off the top of my head. Let's say that you can put minions and money and time into uh, getting more uh, influence on the merchants in a particular city, or having more influence over the lesser vampires in this other city, or making coordination with this other thing, etc., etc. You know, there's all sorts of different things you could place your political affluence and influence on, but... There's another thing you do let, that's, let's just call it rituals, for example. You can just dedicate some of your minions to, to doing these rituals. If you have five minions doing these rituals, or five minion groups or whatever, then you have five blood capacity. Make sense? So in other words, someone go stab Javan real quick. So in other words, you, have, you would basically have to nerf your ability to function in the political arena in order to buff your ability to function in the XCOM arena or find some kind of balance between the two based on your own preference. That kind of a thing. That's my thinking on that one. Uh, the non-vampire option. I love the idea of allowing you to play as a non-vampire. I really do. Like, uh... <laughs> I believe you, Javin. I believe you. But this is the question I was handled, handed, so this is what I'm answering. Um, I love the idea of being able to si not sire someone, but th you basically say, this is my heir. Something happens to me, this is my designated heir, and it's not a vampire. I actually like that idea. We'd have to be very careful about how we play that, 
Because obviously that person would not have the longevity or the powers or the whatever, and that person would still have to go into combat in some fashion when it comes to the XCOM segment. But you could have something like, because you're, you, you know, you don't have the blood capacity mechanic at all, you'd have to have something else. You'd have to have some other method in order to keep up. And I would probably make it more difficult, but I would still make it possible. For example, I would uh, theoretically, just off the top of my head again, I like the idea that a non-vampire lord, so a lord of vampires who is not a vampire, can have more minions to field at any given point in time. Or has, like, a diplomacy bonus with certain types of groups, or probably a diplomacy negative when it comes to other groups. You know, yeah, exactly, Adam. Or maybe you're in, like, Tokyo for some reason. <laughs> and filled with fubus. Uh, thank you very, very much, Tokyo Vampire. Uh, what would you like to put that towards? But yeah, I, I like the idea that it would, you know, that it wouldn't necessarily just hurt your diplomacy rating, but it would basically make it that much more difficult to actually negotiate with all of the other vampire lords on the, on the board because they are looking down at you. You're not a vampire. But I would make that a positive as well. I would make it easier to infiltrate and espionage against other vampire lords because they think so little of you. You know, just stuff like that. Try, try to balance it out so that the non-vampire character is still feasible and still viable. Just a different playstyle. So, uh, I guess that's actually all I got. I, the final part of the question was, how would you market it? Play a vampire lord! There you go, there's the marketing. I'd have to think about that, honestly. Well, it depends, Mandar. We'd have to think about that. We'd have to think about whether or not the vampires would be called a knowledge route. Oh yeah, also, someone earlier mentioned Cave Age vampires. That would be another excellent room for, like, a DLC or an expansion kind of a thing. I'd probably, if I'm being completely honest, what I'd probably do is I'd start off with, like, a modern era thing. Like, say, 2000. You know, it's, it's a nice modernish era. And an era filled with fear. Thank you very, very much, Uthor, as ever much appreciated. What would you like to put that towards? Um, but yeah, set it in like a modernish era, and that would be the vanilla game. And then I would immediately go to work on the expansion packs for adding other eras to the game, back and forward. You know, going back to, you know, getting the steampunk thing, the possibility of a Castlevania thing for like a fantasy thing. Um, going back to probably the Crusades-ish, that's probably popular, you know, just classic medieval uh, definitely go even further back. I'm thinking Bronze Age, actually. And have something in the future as well. Uh, like, say something t 10 steps into the future, 10 minutes into the future, like 20, you know, 50 or whatever, and then something way into the future. I actually agree with Rax. I think this kind of markets itself. And this is why I wish I had infinite power and money, because I have a lot of ideas I'd like to work on in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and I understand how unfeasible it is for that to ever happen. Anywho. Uh, no, I have not, uh, LM. Sorry. Oh, I like that, Adam. <laughs> I have heard of Project Judge, yes. I don't know much about it yet, Tokyo Vampire, but I have heard about it. But if you want to put it towards that, I will jot that down. I know, right, Palan? Let me just... Hang on. Tilda... Uh, add money, 15, something like that. So, uh, I think that's enough Tumblr questions for today. Yes, you do, Huthor, that's why I asked. Uh, so I do actually have some other things to talk about, <laughs> believe it or not. So first of all, I only, usually I have like a little bit of a news section where I just kind of mention things where it's just a brief news tidbit. Um, I only have one thing for this week, and that is I saw a quote that was specifically referring to uh, Spider-Man DLC. Spider-Man, or excuse me, Spider-Man 4. Or not Spider-Man 4, god damn it. The recent Spider-Man PS4 game. That's just called Spider-Man for some freaking red option. Yes, it is, Huthor. Hang on a second, I'll jot that down right now. I got a separate section just for that. Right here. There we go. So jotted. Um, I know, right, Adam? <sighs> And I need to look up this game that Tokyo Vampire mentions. See if I'm willing to add it. So it's called Judge. Project Judge. Put a little asterisk by that. Uh, anyways. 
So, uh, and the quote was, put simply, this is just hysterical, the, the entire article... The world, no, go away. Give me one second. Where the hell is the... There it is. No? There it is. Uh, the entire article was basically, Will single-player games finally make a comeback? Anyways. <laughs> Moving on. So, they're working on a Mega Man live-action game. And by live-action game, I mean live-action show. Before I go any further, what do you guys think? I like Dynasty, Dakota, of those options. Bloodline has too many possibilities of being confused with Masquerade. Hey, let's go back to our usual playlist now that we're done talking about Doom here. The goes with everything playlist. Yeah, why not CG? That's a good question. Especially since CG is basically easier and cheaper to do than it has ever been. There's a reason so many CGI shows exist right now. I know, right, Tigzer? Live action Mega Man. Now, I'm going to go ahead and admit something that's going to make me make fun of, but that's okay. I like to be honest with you guys. I have thought before what Mega Man would look like in real life many times. Because Mega Man, as it is, just does not translate to real life aesthetics at all. It's, it's just the kind of thing that doesn't fit whatsoever. It's just too cartoony in its presentation. So any kind of adaptation of what Rock would look like or Cutman would look like in real life would require massive changes and basically a complete overhaul of its design. Now, I'm not the only person who's done that. If you actually go look up, like, if you do Google image search for Mega Man Realistic, you'll see quite a few different uh, takes and styles that have been done on that. But that is, in my opinion, what that would require. But I'm not as against the idea as I would think I would be. I am still against the idea of a live-action Mega Man show. Let me just go ahead and start with that. Not only because I think a CGI show would work better for, the, for Mega Man... But because I think a CAGI show would work better in general. I actually already discussed this during a previous lore week, but the problem is it's there's just too many tools that are available to a CGI show or an animated show that are not available for a live action show. Now, I know I've already discussed this, but in the off chance you never heard it, I'm just going to rehash the biggest point really quick right off the top of my head. How many of you have watched Star Trek? Now, there's a scene in... I uh, God, I don't remember the episode anymore, but there's a scene in Deep Space Nine where Odo shows up, and he's just kind of doing this, and he has one line of dialogue, okay? That's it. To make that happen in real life, in the construction of the show, Rene Bergenois had to wake up at like 3 in the morning and do a multi-hour makeup call, cast call, in order to get into makeup, in order to get into outfit in order to get in the camera and say his line and then leave. It was a tremendous hassle for the actor and for the actual producers of the show, and it costs more money. And now, that's more relevant with shows where you have something of a fantastical nature. If you're going to have a cast which just has to change their outfit, that's quick and easy. But if you're going to have any kind of makeup, or if you're going to have any kind of CGI, or if you're going to have any kind of touch-up or special effects, you need to have that extra layer on top of things. That extra layer of production is what I'm trying, referring to. So Mega Man involves a fighting robot fighting other fighting robots. That kind of automatically lends itself towards the kind of thing that's going to require a significant amount of production time. Which means doing live action means automatically, right out the gate, you're already nerfing your show, for lack of a better way to put it, because you are ensuring that your budget, both in terms of time and money, is going to be higher than it would if you just did it animated. Because, to, to do the same scene over again, imagine for a moment if Deep Space Nine was an animated show. Rene Abergen, actually a CGI show is a better example of this, because then in that case, Odo would be a model that's already saved. They would have to animate him, but the model is already done. They would have to bring René Abergenois in, he would have to say his line of dialogue in, in the mic, in the, in the recording booth, and then he would leave. 
significantly cheaper in terms of production costs when it comes to the television. Make sense? Um, probably not, no, Palan. I haven't even seen it because I just don't care. <laughs> I mean, I could watch it, I guess. I just really, really don't care. Uh, um, no robot actors. So even just... Even ignoring any possible uh, thoughts of quality or cringe or awkwardness, we've already got a problem because we already have to deal with this you know, live action problem. Um, I mean, you can go ahead and rant, Palan. <laughs> go for it, dude. You're not talking about the trailer where it's like, we've got to go and, and then the galaxy is doomed and all that crap, right? Because I already saw that one. That was like a couple months ago. Anyways. Having said all that, one of the things I've always wanted privately in the back of my head is to make a realistic, or I suppose I should say believable, Mega Man. The kind that you can actually see or picture happening in real life, you know. Um, and there is a specific... I shouldn't even say specific. There are multiple ways to craft that kind of thing. There's multiple ways to try and make something more believable and more realistic and feel like something you could actually see happening rather than just... Hmm? And I have been wanting that for a long time. Now, obviously, I don't have infinite power and money, so I can't actually do that. But I wonder where they're going to go with this one, because in my opinion, there's really only three possibilities here. It's going to be awful. Just, just straight up awful. It's going to be hilariously bad. Or it'll actually manage what I want, you know, like the MCU for Mega Man. And that's a great parallel, because for those of you who have actually seen MCU... It, how many of you guys actually read the comics before the MCU really became a big thing? And how many of you looked at that and were like, how the hell are they going to make Thor look okay in real life? That's ridiculous. How are they going to make Loki look okay in real life? Now they managed it. But at the same time, they also had an enormous amount of money and talent pushing that. So, we'll see. Speaking of television shows, though. Oh, it's a huge shift. As I've talked about before, the reason I didn't see Thor in the theaters, and never had, and I still regret this to this day, was because it was a Thor movie. Because I had read the comics. Because I have actually seen that. I was like, why would I ever want to watch a Thor movie? How, yeah, how are they going to make the Hulk? That's just not going to work. But they managed it. They managed it. Speaking of television, how many of, her, of you have heard of The Mandalorian? Yeah, I remember that too, Ventures. The Mandalorian. The Mandalorian. I like how many people are saying that. I'm just going to keep saying that. No, okay, okay. The Mandalorian is the name of a new television show. A new live-action Star Wars television show. Now, we've already talked about this. In fact, we've talked about the live-action show in general, even when we didn't have any details about it. I stand by my statement. I think CGI is a better choice. I've already rehashed that earlier, and I rehashed that like a few minutes ago, so let's just skip over that topic really quick. There is going to be a new television show called The Mandalorian for Star Wars. It's being headed up by Jean Favreau. Um, it's set in between Episode 6 and Episode 7. It follows a new character who is not Jango or Boba. And we do have a couple of people we know who are going to be involved in directing. Uh, Dave Filoni from... Clone Wars and Rebels, uh, Taiki Watiti, I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, from Thor Ragnarok, Deborah Chow, I don't know what she's from, Rick Famu Famuyawa, Famuyiwa, excuse me, Famuyiwa, I don't actually know who that is. Of course you follow me, they all do. And Bryce Dallas Howard, who I didn't even know she was director. <laughs> but yes, it's set during the dark times. Um, so... Thank you very, very much, Justin, uh, as ever. Much appreciate those, those uh, subs uh, uh, not subscriptions, the donations. 
<laughs> especially since those very much help me out, especially when I, when tax time comes around. So thank you very much again. Um, and you're going to put that towards the Spider-Man 4 DLC, which I'm going to go ahead and jot down really quick right here. 15, 1, 9, 6, 7. The dark times! The dark times! Okay, there was. Um, and, uh... They're probably not pulling Boba at the Sarlacc, but hell, I don't know. They have already started workshopping. They've already started uh, doing efforts and work with the writers. They've already done most of the casting. They've already done a lot of set design. They're basically fairly well along into the production of this show, but it's probably not going to start going out uh, until next year because they're going to want to go and put it out on the Disney streaming service. As much as I really dislike the idea of multiple streaming services, as I've discussed many times before, I have to admit what Disney is doing is probably the smartest thing I've ever seen anyone do with a new streaming service that isn't Netflix, and that is making sure they have as much as possible on it to encourage people to actually use it. So, we'll see how that goes. But that's kind of a separate topic. Moving on. Moving on. I'm not sure what I think about this. What I, I'll tell you the first thing I think about this. The first thing I think about this is that I am happy that it does not involve Jedi. Now, I know that sounds like a strange thing to talk about. Um, but, and it may involve Jedi, and I will be sad if it involves Jedi. But I don't want that. In my opinion, Jedi are cool. I think, I think a lot of us can agree on that. Jedi are cool. They're, they're space monks who have wizard powers and lightsabers. Cool. But I also think that Star Wars focuses too much on the Jedi. I, I think that there's, like, it's, it's hard to find a Star Wars work that really discusses or analyzes or really goes into anything that isn't the Jedi. Even stuff that does also has the Jedi, right? Also has the Force users. Um, honestly, KOTOR 2 is actually probably my favorite example of something that really discussed the non-Force users and was also a game that was all about the Force. I mean, you know, it, it, you get my point. Yeah, Jedi being referenced, I'm with that. I'm with that. Jedi being in the background or making a cameo or being relevant in like an episode or two, I'm with that. But I would like to see more non-Jedi stuff. There's a lot of Star Wars that doesn't involve the Force. They have this huge setting and this huge development and this galaxy to work with and all this tech and all these people and all these cultures. You don't need the Jedi. I'm one of those people who wishes that in the Clone Wars we focused less on Obi-Wan and Anakin. My opinion. I, I was cool with Ahsoka. I'm cool with that because I like her. Rogue Squadron books. That's actually a really good example. I didn't even think about that. Although they had to have Force sensitivity like in book three or four. Yeah, it would help bring up break up the mon monotony. That's exactly what I'm thinking, Jim Bailey. Jimmy Bailey. Like, like, give us a little variety, you know? So I'm hoping that's where they're going with this one. But that's pure speculation. I really have no idea. I really don't. Um, the other thing I wanted to comment on, though, is this is, bizarrely enough, a first. This is the first time we've had a live-action Star Wars show. Isn't that weird? Like, think about that for a second. Yeah, don't don't look up the Sarlacc, Mega. <laughs> I don't actually have much else to say about that. I just think it's very strange that that's never been attempted. But then again, I also think it's strange we never had a good strategy game set in Star Wars. Star Wars. <laughs> Christmas specials do not count. That is correct. A, because they weren't really a television show. They were a, set as like a variety special hour kind of a thing. And B, because screw the holiday specials. But even if I acknowledge the holiday specials, which I don't, um, then they that wasn't actually a TV show, no. Now, what Max Time points out is the final bit of news I have here. So Max Time says people would expect a big production and the money people wouldn't go for it. And he is absolutely correct. Uh, there's just a more of a requirement from Star Wars to be higher production value uh, when it comes to live action stuff. That's kind of what Star Wars was basically all about. I mean, I, I hate to say that, but A New Hope quite literally launched new industries 
in the film industry because of how much they pushed the production values. I, I know that sounds strange to look back at it, but it's true. That being stated, I also think that it basically hasn't been possible to do that level of production in a television format without basically running in the red. And I have proof of this because Young Indiana Jones was the exact same thing. I, I imagine a lot of you actually don't really know what I'm talking about. Yes, that's correct, Hazardous. But for those of you not aware, there was a series of tele television show, it's really hard to call it that, but it was basically a TV show about the Young Indiana Jones show. It was something that Lucas was really pushing, and it was hellaciously expensive because they put movie-level quality into a TV show, and it was just as expensive as you'd imagine. They tried to dump as much as they could into that to make it look just, just as best as they could. And that was back in the 80s and 90s, and that was a lot more expensive to do back then. Nowadays, technology has developed enough, and the industry has developed enough, that it's actually a lot easier, and most importantly cheaper, to do movie level of production value in a television show. In fact, there are modern TV shows that frankly look better than modern movies, so... In other words, as much as I think it's weird it's never been done, I will also agree that from from a, uh, yeah, exactly, Jimmy Bailey, from a financial perspective, now feels like the right time to finally step into this market and, and try this and see how it works. And that's, like I mentioned, that's the final news bit. This show has a very big budget. Uh, we do know that. We do know that they are dumping money on this show, and that doesn't surprise me <laughs> because it's kind of an experiment. They want to go somewhere with it. So, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Young, we don't talk about Young Hercules. We don't talk about Young Hercules. Uh, I'm all, I personally hope that they're doing basically the HBO thing here. Like Game of Thrones. Which had a hell of a budget going for it. But, but, and also did like the the midi season thing rather than the 2022 20, average season thing. Something like that. I don't know. We'll see. Does WoW run on Linux? I mean, technically, everything runs on Linux. Technically. Very technically. Super technically. Then we talked about Aquaman. Aquaman's coming out. Um, so what else? Uh, I have nothing to say about Aquaman. I have no news about Aquaman. Aquaman's coming out, and I have no idea if it's going to be any good or not. Like, we had Wonder Woman. That was awesome. I loved that film, despite its flaws. The ending of Wonder Woman just had serious issues with it. Um, I liked parts of BVS, even though I have been hugely insulted for that opinion. I liked parts of Man of Steel, even though I've been hugely insulted for that opinion. And... Oh god, is that it? Is that all the DCMU has been so far? No, oh, whatever. Anyways. <clears throat> I do have one other thing to talk about. Really quick here. Justice League. Oh yeah, Justice League. There were parts of Justice League I liked. So, I already said BVS. For those of you not heard, yes, I have Tigzar, and I hope he dies in a goddamn fire. We're not going to talk about that news tidbit, because I hope that person dies. And I mean that with total sincerity, and I don't want to come across as too violent on my own show. I have vitriolic hatred for that man, as a consequence of his actions. Moving on. So, uh, how many of you guys are aware of a company called Blizzard Entertainment? I think it's actually Activision Blizzard right now, but whatever. I suppose I should explain myself. Before we talk about the Blizzard thing, god damn it, Tigzar. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let's talk about... Asshole. Asshole. I'm just gonna make the note right here. It just says asshole. That's what it says in my notes. So, Asshole, I refuse to say his name, um, he does not deserve a name, is a jackass who wrote the Witcher series of books. Now, I have no idea if the Witcher books are any good or not. I don't. I mean, I, I read one of them back in the day. It was not particularly well translated. I hated it, personally. But I, I'm told that that's not indicative of whether or not the, the books are good or not. Blah, 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 blah. But the, the long story short being, I've never actually cared about the book series. In fact, I cared so little about the book series that I refused to wander into the uh, wander into the games for the longest time. 
as anybody who's a longtime viewer of my show knows, we actually had a kind of a thing for a while there that people constantly asked me to ruminate on Witcher 1, and I constantly said no because I didn't want to. I had no interest in the franchise until finally my, my demands were met and I finally, finally did a rumination on Witcher 1. And then I did Witcher 2, which I actively disliked. And then far more recently, just a couple years ago now, I finally looked at Witcher 3, which I loved. Witcher 1 was okay. You know, I, I liked Witcher 1 well enough. Witcher 2 is a game I'll never play again. Uh, and Witcher 3 is one of my favorite games of all time. Make of that what you will. <sighs> so... Uh, that's all cool. That's my own opinion on it and my own history with the franchise. I say that because I know that there are people who will dismiss my opinion purely because I don't read the books, because there are people who think that way. Asshole, McJackass, excuse me, Cord, has decided to sue now. I want to stress that because there's a lot of relevant points here. Like, if I just told you the bullet point, which is, Asshole is suing CD Projekt Red for money, for, for money from the Witcher series, that doesn't get it across. That's just bad. That's not horrific disgust. Which is what this is. So now, years and years after the Witcher series is well established and has been well successful, both in the books and in the games, now he's deciding to go ahead and sue for money because he wants money. This guy has also been a jackass in general. That's point number two. Uh, this guy has been... <sighs> Like, the worst kind of elitist. You know what I mean? Games aren't art kind of elitist. You know, the, the games have no impact on my my books. If anything, I think the books have pushed the sales of the games. The games are crap. You know, just... <sighs> I'm not going to pull up his quotes, because I don't care enough. I have actually looked up quotes of his. Direct quotes. He's been an asshole for years. This is nothing new. That's point two. Um, like 50, almost 15 years, yeah. <laughs> you know, you say that, Javan. You and I both know there's people like that. Uh, I actually don't know how to pronounce the name. Sapkowski is how I've always heard it said, but I don't know if I actually know if that's accurate. Anyways, um, point three. This one pisses me off most of all. So what he's doing is he's basically saying, I want a bigger piece of the pie. I want money. I want you to give me money. And that's what he's saying. Now, um, that's kind of suck and greedy and avaristic. He's... Hang on, hang on. I'm not at the worst part yet. Uh, but he's, you know, hey, you know, I, I just want this money from your thing that I've been crapping on this entire time. I've caught myself almost cussing twice. That's how much this pisses me off. Um, I... I, I I was so... This is... I'm sorry. This is all his fault, as far as I'm concerned. He has been so dismissive for so long of the games. For him to just come around and say, Oh, I want money. I mention that because it's all about the money and nothing else. It's not about his creative rights. It's not about making sure he is not being screwed over by a company. CD Projekt Red tried to give him more money. We have documented evidence of this. Contracts. That prove, this is not speculation, that CD Projekt Red tried to give him more money, tried to give him a percentage, tried to give him more royalties, or royalties at all. He said no. So this is not the, the, the lone artist is struggling against the big corporation. This is the big corporation is being bullied by the lone artist. Which is just bizarro land, but there it is. Which brings me to the point that pisses me off most of all. He's probably going to win. I am so glad that CD Projekt Red did not settle out of court. I am so happy about that. I really am. I hope they take him to court. And I hope they win. Because, in my opinion, he's wrong. Now. The problem is, he will probably win. Because I, I actually looked into this. And I've actually had... Uh, I've, I've read some lawyers' take on the treaties... The problem isn't... See, it... The problem is nothing matters other than the base Polish law regarding... Uh, I, God, I, I can't remember what the name is right now. Please forgive me. There's a Polish law about this sort of thing. And that Polish law basically says he has the right to do this. Just... The end. Now, law is not set in stone, at least in most countries. 
And therefore, there is still the possibility that, that CD Projekt Red will win this lawsuit and will actually be able to push this. That would probably end up altering the law in Poland, at least uh, in terms of precedence, if not in actual writ law. Or adding an exemption, for example. But the problem is, the law is actually on his side. And that's what pisses me off most of all. That this petty, selfish, greedy asshole has decided for no other reason other than simple avarice and elitish dickishness to try and go after a company that was nice to him and tried to be kind in return to him and has given him credit multiple times for being the, you know, the source of this and all this. And he has decided to go say and just rip money out of their talents. And again, 15 years later, it's, it's actually been like 14 years, excuse me, but still 14 years later, now, like I said, that was point one. Now he's deciding to do this. So I hope he dies. Because that's the only good answer out of this one. <sighs> Moving on. I don't actually hope he dies. I don't want anyone to die. Death is a horrible thing. <laughs> I, have to, I have to admit that. Because death is a horrible thing. Death is never a good thing. Well, that's not true either, but whatever. Ugh. <sighs> I suppose I should bring up the final point, which several people have already brought up in chat, and that's the fact that this has the potential to really alter law in Poland and possibly in the EU. And as a consequence, then, um, that could be very bad in the future. See, this is such this, this is another reason this pisses me off so much. Normally, I actually am kind of in favor of this sort of law. I really am. It's there to, it, as someone said, it's there to protect people from things like the Warner Brothers. I, I agree with that. That kind of a law to protect the rights of the creator from a company, I'm with that. I like that idea. This is someone abusing a good idea for bad intent, which is a very common thing. But this could set up some very serious dominoes. This could set up a lot of problems going in the future, basically no matter which direction it goes. And I agree with Hazardous. I'm very happy that CD Projekt Red went public with this. For those of you not aware, uh, the original intent and frankly threat of the initial lawsuit was this better not go public. If this goes public, this will seriously damage CD Projekt Red's, you know, reputation. So you better not go public about this. And then CD Projekt Red went public with this. And I am so happy that they did. Even if CD Projekt Red loses this, which they probably will, in my, in my mind, in the mind of the consumer, they're still the good guys in this one. They're still the ones who are on the side of right on this particular argument, on this particular thing. Uh, no, Jobin, they said they're taking him to court last I read, which is a few days ago. It does make them look good. This is actually going to really help CD Projekt Red's PR, weirdly enough. It's the one good thing that's going to come out of this. Oh yeah, I also now have a, uh, a hard line. I have a concrete reason to never read the Witcher books. <laughs> that's just the silver lining there. Uh... What irritates me is that this if this was being done in the States... Um, it, he wouldn't even have a case. Like, I, I speak so much about state, you know, law and legality and how awful it is, but in this case, uh, th this would not even reach court. This would not even reach, this would go in front of a judge, not a jury. This would go in front of a judge, the judge would read over it, and the judge would say, you have no case, dismissed with prejudice. And that would be the end of it. Because he just has no case. The only reason he has any case at all is because of that law. The Article A4 or whatever hell it is. It's the only reason he has any feet to stand on. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. 
<laughs> I, I heard about that, Tigzer. So anyways, now that we got that just pile of hatred out of the way. Jesus, I didn't need that. Uh, anyways. Uh, new timestamp, because we moved forward. Uh, let's talk about Blizzard. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, let's talk about Blizzard. Let's talk about Blizzard. Ugh. I need a nap. Uh, let's... <laughs> I feel drained. I don't like feeling angry. Yeah, small indie company. Small indie company. So, um, I'll be playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey Equalitas. Mike Morhane stepped down from Blizzard. Now that's interesting. And I wanted to talk about that really quickly. Uh, Mike Morhane is one of the only... <laughs> I shouldn't say only, but he's one of the only remaining original members of Blizzard who has now bowed out. A lot of the original staff who helped found uh, Synergetic and Synaptics, or whatever they were originally called, has since bowed out of the company. Most, Almost all retired, by the way. Most of these people have since made their fortune, and they're, they're retired and they're done with game development. But Morhane's out. Now, what's interesting is Mike Morhane... Morhane, excuse me, I always say his name wrong. Uh, has the charisma of a dead houseplant. Silicon and Synapse, thank you. Now, I mention that because he's actually, he likes to go on camera. He likes to be the person who talks about things personally. The man has no charisma. The man has negative charisma. He's actually irritating to see on camera, in my opinion. But it's also worth noting that Morhaime has always been someone who is a good president has made a lot of good decisions over the years and has had a lot of good leadership qualities and has good, d done a good job as the president of Blizzard. He's one of the original co-founders, uh, co by the way. That's how far back he goes. Back in 91, I want to say. Sorry, Hazardous. Let me get off your screen here really quick because I, no, I have no charisma. Um, <clears throat> he, he did a good job of his role, relatively speaking. Now, I can't speak in specifics, unfortunately. But the man also always had a very legitimate passion for what he was doing. It's one of the things I always give credit to all of the, you know, the original Blizzard people is they gave a damn. You know what I mean? Um, it's something that I've always actually, uh, well, I, more in the past now, but always praised about Blizzard's development team is they gave a damn, right? <laughs> and I liked that. And he's gone now. Um, some other guy I've never even heard of has decided, has, has stepped in and is now the new, uh, is now the new president. He's worked there before. He's worked there for like 15 years. I've never even heard of this guy, so I can't even speak to him or what he's going to be like. But that by itself is just, that's just a minor news tidbit. What really strikes me about this is this basically means at this point that Blizzard is almost entirely the new guard at this point. In fact, actually, we're so far beyond this now that with all the old guard gone, we actually have like the middle guard, which, which has been here for a few years now, like this new guy. And then we've got the new guard, which is being brought in over the last couple of years. And I'm not even sure what that means at this point. One of the things I complained about during Battle for Azeroth, and I don't want to get into that right now, but one of the things I complained about is that there was a lot of things that Blizzard could be doing that they weren't. And I know that's a terrible complaint because it basically means I wish I had more better rather than what I have right now. But one of the things I mentioned, and this is just my impression, was that in the last couple of years, Blizzard has gotten too safe that they haven't really been pushing the envelope in any particular manner. Um, not counting WoW. Not counting WoW, because Legion really pushed the envelope. Uh, but, you know, it's, they've basically not really been doing anything with StarCraft. It's basically just kind of been treading water for a while. Diablo, excuse me, Diablo, trying to get better about it, has been doing nothing <laughs> for years at this point. Uh, Heroes of the Storm, they, they were really pushing that for a bit, and then that just kind of tapered off. Overwatch, I don't even want to get into Overwatch. Hearthstone, uh, actually, I'll give Hearthstone some credit. And then, uh, speaking of which, uh, one of the developers, uh, one of the main developers and senior producers for Hearthstone has also bowed out. Yes, he's one of the middle ground. That's what I was just talking about, Necro Gangster. Middle guard. <sighs> um, so I'll give them Hearthstone, I'll give them WoW. It's just, I keep looking at it like, why haven't you done anything else? You have more money than God. What are you doing, Blizzard? Now, I don't know the answer to that question. I really don't. Because 
it's not Blizzard, it's Activision Blizzard. Or Blizzard Activision. So I really don't know where they're going with this. But... I lament where this is... Where it seems like this is going. Because it feels like they're going the opposite of Nintendo. Now, hear me out. Nintendo does some really horrible, stupid, awful stuff that pisses me off. It, it always amuses me when someone calls me a Nintendo fanboy, because Nintendo aggravates the crap out of me. But, the one thing I will always give Nintendo, and this is still true to this very year, the one thing I will always give Nintendo is that they branch out and they try stuff. They, they, they try things, at least on the development side of things. They try they, they push envelopes, and they say, well, let's make a Mario XCOM! That was actually Ubisoft. But Nintendo was involved in the development of that. They still try. They still push. They, st they go in different directions. Sometimes it fails. Uh, it's on the Premier Run list, Tech. Uh, sometimes it fails, and sometimes it succeeds, and they just do that. They just, hey, uh, hey, uh. Blizzard, it feels like they're doing the exact opposite. Okay, this is what will get us a return on investment, so we're going to do this. And that, yeah, it, yeah, I fear they're going to be turning into Valve. That's actually a, a valid way to put that. I fear they're going to turn into Valve. What Valve has become over the last few years. And I don't want that. It would make me sad. I've been a Blizzard fan since 90-something. I don't know when. I'd have to figure it out. Warcraft 1. That was my original. I, I've, I've been on board since Warcraft 1. And I'm not saying that they're bad now. I'm not saying the good old days. I am mostly afraid for the future than I am for the present, if that makes any sense. I agree, actually, next time. 92? I, I believe you. It was, it was pretty early on. It was before I hit high school. There's still a valve. There's only steam. That, that sentence without the capitals makes sense. Uh, um... I will say this, so several of you have already pointed this out, and this is a valid point. There, there's a lot of rumors, big asterisk, big asterisk. There's a lot of rumors that right now there's going to be a lot of big Di Di Diablo news. Sorry, I'm so used to the British pronunciation. Diablo news uh, when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to BlizzCon this year, in less than a month. We're actually a few weeks out at this point. And maybe that'll be awesome. My biggest fear, I'll go ahead and say this right now on camera, my biggest fear is that the Diablo uh, announcement will be, here's a new anime, which I personally won't care about, or, and that's it! <laughs> you know? Okay. Hmm. I mean, there's not going to be any real WoW news at BlizzCon. BFA just hit. So, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I know in Spanish it's Diablo. It's just, I've been saying Diablo for... When did Diablo 1 come out? Because that's how long I've been saying it. A British friend of mine was the one who introduced me to the series. I'm going to talk about it when we start the Diablo lore run! How many of you guys are looking forward to the Diablo lore run? Someone, please? <laughs> I've been putting a lot of work into this, and I'm going to be fraying my hair to get it done. Ah. <sighs> The Diablo anniversary was last year or the year before. I can't remember which. We'll see. Okay, that, that makes me feel better. A lot of there are people who aren't hazardous who are looking forward to it. I'm gonna have to start the Diablo lore run with a disclaimer that's gonna make people not watch it. I'll tell you it right now. Uh, in order of preference. I prefer Diablo 3 over 2 over 1. I know. Anyways, <clears throat> I got one last thing to talk about. Other than Morhaim. <laughs> I will explain my opinion, I swear, once we get to the actual lore run. Because there's a lot of reasons why I have that opinion. <laughs> yeah, I just lost half my Diablo viewers. That's okay. I'm, I'm going to be honest with you guys. Am I going to be playing the X-Packs? I will not be playing Hellfire for one, Venters, but I will be playing Lord of Destruction, and I will be playing Reaper of Souls. In fact, it's kind of impossible for me to not play Reaper of Souls at this point in time. 
Uh, it's worth noting I like all three games. Make it that what you will. How does one even get Diablo 1 anymore? It took a lot of work. I did get it running, but it took a lot of work. Diablo 2 was a lot of effort, too. I had to do a lot of custom patches to make that work. Diablo 3 is easy. I just hit play. <laughs> Diablo. Still working on it. No promises. That's the other boilerplate I'm going to have to give right at the beginning. How many of you guys care about Telltale? So I've, I've already spoken about the Telltale thing. I've already kind of discussed the Telltale thing. Yay. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of Telltale games. I love Tales from the Borderlands. Uh, thank you, Sugar Bell. <laughs> so, uh, Kirkman decided to go ahead and basically rip the licensing rights back to his company, Skybound. And Kirkman, excuse me, Skybound is now going to be producing the rest of Telltale Season 4. He has also been reaching out, although there's a, there's a lot of hassle and bureaucratic paperwork that has to be dealt with here, but he's also reaching out to hire on the actual developers of Walking Dead Season 4 who from Telltale, the people who are now unemployed, in order to go do a contract job with Skybound in order to work on Season 4. So that's where we're at right now with that. I point this out because, first of all, I freaking call it. I told you that switching licensing isn't actually that hard, assuming the companies are okay with switching licensing. And since a lot of those licensings come from Skybound, since they actually own half of the original rights, uh, this, was a, this was a smoother transition than it should have been. So that's cool. I do think that's a very good thing. Um, I hope that we're able to actually basically get what is functionally the exact same game we were going to get originally. I have no idea if that's even possible at this point. Because, again... There's hassles involved with even getting these people uh, hired. And yes, I know the skeleton crew got laid off. Because, t t I told you guys, Telltale's gone. In a way that companies usually don't go away. I tried to discuss that last week. Um, what I really want to talk about, though, is... Again, this is kind of a going forward thing. I want to talk about the idea of several other... So, okay. That's the first thing. Skybound has procured the licensing rights back. They're going to go ahead and push forward with Season 4. That's all fact. Let's enter the realm of the rumor here. If you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm drawing out an asterisk. That, that's what I'm doing when I do that. Uh, let's enter the realm of rumor. Because apparently THQ Nordic has been in discussions and negotiations with multiple companies to procure licensing rights to things that Telltale was going to be working on, including... Uh, uh, Wolf Among Us. This is, again, rumor. But of all of the companies that exist in the world, I would bet THQ Nordic would be doing this more than anyone else. <laughs> it's, it's probably the only thing that I find to be even remotely believable. I also wouldn't be too surprised if they start up a new little subdivision and started, you know, basically started up their own version of Telltale. I don't know. Again, rumor. I want to stress this word. Rumor. But I believe it. This, this is, in my opinion, a fairly believable rumor. Um, we'll see where they go with that. Yeah, I heard about that too, Jaludo. The it, Basically, what this might mean... We'll see how this works on. I don't know why, Jimmy Bailey. Uh, we'll see how this works out. But the general idea... Now, this is pure speculation at this point. The general idea would be, okay, so now we have the rights to make a Wolf Among Us game. It wouldn't be called Wolf Among Us Season 2, obviously. But in every way that matters, it would be Wolf Among Us Season 2. They would, it would, they would just make the same game, set in the same IP that they were going to make. I don't know what they're going to do with the engine, because there's some issues with regards to where exactly the rights exist on that or don't exist. And Lord knows the Telltale engine is kind of crap, but we'll see where they go with that. We could see them just shift over to something a lot simpler and easier to do, like, uh, you know, Unity or Unreal, you know, something that already is a pre-existing, well-established engine, and just kind of do the animations and, and drop down the text boxes there. I don't know. I don't know where they're going with that. <laughs> I don't actually care that much about engine either, personally, but I do think they, they, they're about the point that I'm, where they needed an overhaul, my opinion. My opinion on that. And yeah, I'm very curious how Darksiders 3 is going to turn out. 
Jesus, Jimmy Bailey. Um, I hope this happens. I'm one of those people who had nothing wrong with... People are all like, oh my god. You know, Telltale is, is this decrepit, horrible thing, and it's crap. And I hate Telltale games. I'm the opposite of that. I was one of those people who all I could think of was how many other games I wanted a Telltale game in, you know? I enjoyed the format. I was not bored with it. I was not overwhelmed with it. But apparently they weren't selling. And there's nothing to get around that. They just weren't selling. Which means I have no idea what else they could do. As I pointed out earlier, they can't go the Detroit method. I mean, they, I suppose they could go the Detroit method, but the Detroit method is, is a completely different perspective. The Detroit method is spending five years on a single game. <laughs> you know? Because that's what, that's what it took to push out Detroit. Um, they could go more down-to-earth. They could, they could actually make it even easier and simpler so they could have more branching options, basically make it a little bit more of a text adventure. I don't know. I don't know. Well, yeah, I, I think Telltale Corporate can go burn in a goddamn fire. What they did was just... was hor It's a... In my opinion, this is a... You can quote me on this. It is a rare circumstance where the realm of the illegal and the immoral actually coincide. <laughs> and what Telltale Corporate did to their developers was illegal and immoral. <laughs> it was messed up. Very messed up. My heart goes out to those people. If I already had power and money, all of those people would have jobs right now. Anyways. All the developers, I mean, that were laid off. They're like, hey! First of all, let's get you out of San Francisco. The, the cost of living there is stupid. Let's go someplace better. Oh, no, I want them to just keep burning, Jimmy Bailey. No, I'm kidding. Pain is worse than death. Anyways. <laughs> Uh, actually, that's all I've got this week, uh, as far as news. Again, biggest news, you know, Patreon, woo, Floodgates votes, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, I, I feel drained. So what I'm going to do, because this lore week took a lot longer than I thought, I'm going to go ahead and basically pause for lunch, and then I'm going to go ahead and start up Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Oh, real quick, um, Tizara, if you're there, uh, or on the VOD, I know what you're thinking. Oh my god, he forgot about the dark chocolate thing. Actually, no, I didn't. It's just not here yet. I, I, apparently, I couldn't get it through Amazon Prime shipping. You know, Amazon two-day shipping or whatever. So, it's not here yet. <laughs> so, I swear I'll do the dark chocolate thing. I haven't forgotten. Anyways. Yes, Tazara donated $20 for me to eat 99% dark chocolate on camera. Yeah, anyways, <laughs> chopping off the recording. 